armed with these this set of ideas, we are now going to see how this simple mechanism of this kind of adaptive threshold can drive learning in the brain in a way that's computationally useful. And the first idea we're going to explore is based on uh, essentially the same ideas that uh, Bean and Stock, Cooper and Monroe explored in the form of self-organizing learning, which learns the general statistics of the world. And then after that, we'll see that there are certain important limitations to that self-organizing learning. And we'll see how this exact same learning dynamic can actually be extended to produce error-driven learning. And that's much more powerful and much more capable of shaping the brain to do behaviorally effective forms of learning. So here's the intuition. This again is exactly what Bean and Stock Cooper and Monroe articulated in 1982 that um, you know, for some overall typical level of activity, the threshold might be here on this diagram, but that if you um, reduce the amount of activity, so in these, in these uh, studies that I just showed you, where there's less activity in a particular hemisphere of the brain, then the threshold, which is a function of the sort of average, long-term average activity of the receiving neuron, that's what we're showing here with this bracket Y, they do start firing more. The, level of postsynaptic activity goes up on average and that shifts the balance in this negative feedback way to now say that more of the curve is uh, will drive LTD or decreases in synaptic weight changes um, and that then makes the neuron less likely to get active and this is exactly a kind of homeostatic negative feedback loop which tends to keep the, the neurons overall in this kind of happy, middle, balanced level of activity. If they get uh, too active, they get punished here. If they don't get active enough, they get kind of boosted so that they get back into the game and you end up with this kind of nice, even level of activity. And that turns out computationally to be very beneficial. This expression is a mathematical expression for the average, and I'm just putting a suffix here of L, which means a long-term average and uh, on the x-axis here, we're plotting the expected value or the average of the sending activity x times the receiving activity y. This is over a relatively short period of time as that calcium is kind of accumulating um, moment by moment, sort of roughly on the order of 10 to 20 milliseconds, that kind of time scale. Okay, now we're going to explore how self-organizing learning emerges We'll see a more advanced version of this model in chapter six under perception, where we can actually simulate uh, responses of neurons in V1. Consistent with that, we're gonna look here at stimuli that are a really, really simple version of what we think is going on in, in the real visual world, which is that the primary uh, components of the visual world are edges, okay? And this is actually now well established in, in statistical analyses of visual inputs. The number one thing that kind of dominates the low level visual world is edges. Some objects exist, they have contiguous regions, and then inevitably at some point they end and something else picks up in your visual field. And that transition point um, is the edge and we're just simulating in this very simple model, a five by five input, and we're just putting all the different possible horizontal and vertical edges or lines into this uh, input. And so on any given sample of the, this environment, you're gonna see a horizontal and vertical, you can sometimes see two vertical lines, um, but you'll see two lines drawn essentially at random. According to the initial synaptic connections, those that particular pattern of input will drive excitatory conductances in the hidden layer according to the random initial synaptic weights. And this is an important feature of almost all of our models that we start out with essentially random initial weights. That initial randomness kind of seeds the model with some ability for some neurons to respond and not all neurons. If all the neurons responded identically, then they would never do anything different. Um, and so we need to actually take advantage of this randomness as a way to kind of seed the initial learning of the model and get neurons that respond differentially. And we'll see that there's a really important kind of positive feedback loop that takes hold here 
and individual neurons which randomly happen to respond more to a particular set of inputs now will have synaptic weight changes that essentially reinforce that initial direction of, of learning uh, and they become even more strongly attracted to the particular input patterns that they initially respond to. And that's a critical kind of positive feedback loop aspect of Hebbian self-organizing learning that is both kind of, you know, it's number one strength, but also, as we'll see later, a little bit of a limitation on, on what it can actually learn. In any case, uh, what we see in this particular input is, again, that this neuron over here, if we look at it, in terms of its synaptic weights, just by chance happens to have a pretty good set of strong weights that align with those that, that cross pattern that we're seeing in the input. Um, and so that's why that neuron happens to get the most amount of excitation. But you can see that, in fact, when we look at GE, the overall amount of excitatory conductance, it's not like it's hugely more active. It's just slightly more active than any of the other neurons. And so these subtle small differences are actually getting magnified because we have inhibitory competition. So I click on GI and now I can see this overall feed forward feedback level of inhibition that's being computed. Again, we don't have the inhibitory interneurons. We're just simulating this mathematically using the FFFB equations. And uh, that gives us a overall pattern of activity where only a few neurons are active for any given input pattern. And it's specifically, again, those that receive the most excitatory input. The rest are all below their firing thresholds. They're getting more inhibition than excitation and not firing. And because Hebbian learning has this characteristic that the channels, so the calcium channels only open up when both the pre and postsynaptic, so these are the presynaptic neurons down here, these are the postsynaptic or receiving neurons up here, you only get calcium on the synapses that connect those two uh, neurons, okay? So the, the, the neuron has to be active at the sending level and at the receiving level. If you have a, in a, uh, neurons that are not active, as you can see here, at the receiving level in the hidden layer, those synapses are not going to change. Neither are the synapses going to change for the neurons that are not active in the input. Okay, so that restricts the scope of learning to those synapses that are, have activity on both sides. And we can actually see the effects of learning by clicking on R D weight. And as you can see, the neuron that got really excited has gotten enough calcium coming in from both the sending activity and the receiving activity to get over that uh, higher threshold and the synapses are increasing in strength. And we can see that because this color scale here and the, the positive direction of the, the cubes indicate that those synapses are increasing in strength over time. And this is gonna be the most strongly set, uh, most strongly increasing set of synapses belong to this particular receiving neuron because it got the most activity. If we go back and look at the activation pattern, you can see this other neuron right next to it that didn't get nearly as activated and because it, but it did get some level of activity and that's exactly the kind of pattern that it then will drive this intermediate level of calcium that results in a long-term depression of those synaptic weights. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're now seeing this kind of blue color in the negative range. And the, you can kind of see it a little bit in the 3D drawing here. It's not perfectly clear, but those are uh, boxes going kind of negative below the plane. And that's what it tells us that those are negative weight changes going below zero. So these weights have now decreased in strength for this neuron while they've increased in strength for this neuron. And so now, in fact, this neuron is more likely to respond to that input pattern next time. Whereas this kind of nearby neuron that was kind of weakly activated by this input is actually less likely to respond. And that's also gonna be true most likely of this one over here as well. And this one over here that were weakly activated, the neurons that were kind of more strongly activated, I'm gonna guess, are in the front here. They also got their weights increasing, but you can see their weights are increasing less. They're getting less LTP 
compared to the neuron that was most strongly activated. So this comes directly out of the BCM Hebbian learning rule. And what it does very sensibly, it says, well, if, if there's a neuron that really likes a particular input pattern, let's strengthen that association. Let's make that neuron even like that input pattern even more. So it'll be more likely to respond next time. But other neurons that might be kind of weakly excited about that pattern, but they're not really the perfect fit, we're actually gonna discourage those neurons from getting into the game. We're gonna say, well, you guys, since you're kind of not that close, maybe you should think about doing something else, right? And this is kind of very intuitive. You see it in terms of niche finding among siblings. If one of the kids in your family is really, really good at math, then somehow like the other kids are like, well, maybe I should be good at music or English or some other topic, you know? Um, and so that just is a very natural kind of competitive inhibitory dynamic uh, that leads to specialization or niche finding consistent with principles of evolution that you have special you have speciation kinds of dynamics that are taking place allowing individual neurons to kind of focus on a particular niche um, and and optimize their synaptic weights uh, uh, to be better at detecting patterns within some set of patterns that they initially respond strongly to um, and sort of discouraging competition from other uh, neurons and then those other neurons should hopefully find other things to do and focus on their niche and so that you have a more optimal distribution of the overall resources so to speak where resources in this case is kind of like overall potential for activity. And so again, this inhibitory competition that's operating in the hidden layer is equivalent to essentially the limited resources that are present in the natural environment that force individual organisms, in the case of evolution, to do different things. You can't all get the same resources. And so by distributing those neurons across different aspects or niches in the, of the input world, um, you're getting a more even optimal kind of distribution of the representational space in this hidden layer 